All right, time for a demonstration. Tonight is Eugene Soto with Mutz Blanks. He's going to show us what he knows. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for coming. Any questions? <laughs> okay, uh, what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to try to compress uh, casting. Okay? Um, I. I did an outline that I want to. I want to, you know, try to follow. Um, the, the first thing I want to clarify is is plastic. You know, a lot of folks out there that are not familiar with different types of resin. You know, they'll say, "I'm." You know, how do you turn plastic? Uh, how do you cast plastic? Um, and they, they they throw it all in that one category. It's it's not. We don't turn plastic. We we turn resins, different kind of resins. You have the the most popular ones for, for the, the, the hobbyist would be you know, polyester resin, epoxy, and, and urethane resins, okay? They're all good resins, okay? Uh, they have their advantages and their disadvantages. Some people like some more than others, and some people hate some more than others, okay? Um, when folks say, do you cast acrylic? Acrylics are made at the factory level. I, I, I'm not aware of anybody that actually makes acrylic blanks in their garage or in their shop. Okay, we use urethanes, polyester resins, epoxies, but as far as acrylic goes, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, and and the the at the industrial level, they are making sheets about as big as plywood, and then they cut them into pen blanks. So these are very very big sheets um, that are made at the industrial level. Um, I don't have the space or the know-how or the tank size to do that, okay? So I concentrate on, on using urethane resin, specifically alumilite. I've used polyester resin. It's a great resin. Uh, but for me, the, the chemical smell of it when you're working with it, even with respirators, um, it's a little overwhelming. I can't, my sinus can't handle it. Um, it makes me very uncomfortable and... and in addition to that, once you're done casting, that, that, that smell lingers. You know, if you're casting in your garage, your wife and your kids are going to smell it in their bedrooms, okay? So it's a very strong chemical um, uh, smell. You know, there's certain precautions you've got to take with, with all resins, but sp specifically with polyester resin, um, you know, respirators, fresh air, a way you shouldn't be casting in the kitchen counter or on the kitchen counter. Um, we're going to be working with food. It's just there are a lot of chemicals in there that are not good for you. Epoxies are, are also another good option. Uh, for me, for what I do, I, I, I don't use epoxy a whole lot just because it takes too long to cure. The, uh, if, if I were to do four cycles on my tanks, I got 14 active tanks right now um, that when orders come in, uh, I, I, on a busy day, I can cycle them four times each. So that's... I don't know, 14 times 12, where are my math geniuses out there, or 14. So that, that's how many blocks I can make in one day. If I were working with epoxy, I could only fill the tanks one, you know, one time, and then I'm done until the next 24 hours uh, so that that resin could properly cure. So I stick to alumilite because it's easy on my sinus. Um, it cures a lot, a lot faster, and they have different options. They have, I use five of their resins. I use the clear, I use the, the clear slow, I use the white, I use the RC3 tan, and I use the RC3 black. They're all good resins, um, but they all have their specific, their specific uses, okay? Um, equipment, okay? You can start casting with, with, you know, a plastic mold. I bought this one in, in Hobby Lobby. You can make pen blanks in, in this mold, okay? If you're into pen uh, bottle stoppers, if anybody here drinks pills, these, I don't think so, but anyway, you can ask your, 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 your parents or older neighbors, you know, if they have any pills around the house that they've used, and you can use the containers to, to make, and this is the perfect size for a, for a bottle stopper, because you can make little ones, or you can make big ones, and it, 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 you pour the resin in there, and it pops right out, okay, you just go like that, and it comes right out, so they're reusable, um, if, after about 
10 uses, they, they start sticking if you're not using release. So all you have to do is just make a 116 inch hole in the bottom and then put the, the uh, air compressor, just point it away from you because it'll, it'll take off, okay? I've heard. So you could use, uh, uh, if your neighbor's selling his house and he sold the house, the, the for sale sign, they toss it. You can take that, cut it up. It's made out of that cor corrugated plastic and with a little bit of uh, uh, caulking, put it on a, piece of, on a piece of wood, make a square, put caulking on the bottom, let it dry. You can use that as a mold. And it'll be a one-time use mold, but if you're not into production or making a lot of the same size blanks, you know, you can use that for one time, get your blank, and then get rid of it. Um, Alumolite. It creates, when, when it's curing, it, it, it creates heat. You mix part A, part B, it creates heat. Part of that process creates CO2, which, which creates bubbles, okay? So you hear a lot of comments on the forums, folks saying, hey, I, you know, I, I got moisture in my, in my mix, or somebody says, I have bubbles in my mix. What happened? The first, answer, first reply is, you got moisture in there. And, and that might be true. But it, it also is a byproduct of the curing process. It creates CO2, and if it doesn't have enough time for those bubbles to rise to the surface and, and pop, it's going to stay in the resin. And when you start turning it, you get these really nice white freckles as you're turning your blank. Now, there's, if you're cheap like me, okay, um, you can save that blank. You know, if you're really, it's a blank that, that, that you really want to keep. Um, if you bought it, I just go back to the vendor and say, hey, you know, it had micro bubbles in it and they should replace it or give you a refund. But if you want to save that blank, even after they give you the refund, okay, what you can do is, is use uh, either uh, food coloring or even the, the transit colors. Just sand it and where all those little reds or whatever those white specks are at, take a paper towel with, with some food dye don't blow the dust out. Leave the dust in the little, you know, in the little holes. And what will happen is that dust will absorb the, the dye. And now you're going to have red freckles instead of white freckles. Sometimes it's a highlight. But if you have a red blank, for example, you use red dye, it kind of it, it, it camouflages the, the, the little white specks. And then do a CA finish on it to seal all that in there. So if there are, you can save them if you really want to. Generally, I would just, you know, toss them and then, you know, ask for, a, for another one, okay? Um, so, for alumilite, you, you almost always need a pressure pot. And the reason is, is so that, that CO2 that's created in the mix, when you put pressure on it, it compresses, liquefies those bubbles, and they're invisible to the, to the naked eye. They're still in there somewhere. If you look at them with a microscope, you're going you're gonna to find the little dimples in there, uh, but... but with the naked eye, you can't see them, and you shouldn't be able to feel them, okay? But they're still in there. Uh, so that's why you normally need pressure with, with alumilite. Now, if you're using RC3, the RC3 version, okay, which is a, it, it's a much quicker curing resin from alumilite, um, but it also, it's a lot thinner, so the advantage of that is that the bubbles tend to rise to the surface a lot quicker. So you can get away with, with mixing RC3 resin uh, without, a, without a pressure tank. And, and additionally, the, the colors with the RC3 is going to be a flat color. It's not going to be a, a pearlescent uh, mica-looking color. So even if you do get the white specks when you sand it, um, they're not... They're, they're not, they don't highlight as much as when you're doing the, the translucent or the mica um, mixed resins. Okay, so they're, they're, you can, with that one, you can get away with, uh, with not using a pressure tank. I would always recommend with Alumilite to use a pressure tank. Um, but I've casted before without using a pressure tank. And today we're going to do a mix without the pressure tank. Um, just so you can see that it, that it can be done. Okay. The, uh, the equipment, okay, you have molds. Like I said, you can use anything for a mold. You can use, these are plastic tubes from like Hobby Lobby where they put candies or seeds or whatever. You can use these. Normally, it'll be a one-time use. Either it's going to stick or it's going to deform it because of the heat. Um, but if you all, all you need is one blank, you can use those. You can use your wife's baking dishes 
just don't tell her, okay? <laughs> these work fine. Put some release on them, and, and they, these are, they'll last forever, okay? Unless, you're, unless you're, your resin sticks to it, you can still make a hole, but just don't, make sure you don't put it in the dishwasher because the wife is going to ask how did that hole get in there, okay? So these are very usable. Um, High-density polyethylene, uh, butcher, not butcher block, but cutting block material. This works just fine. Again, if, if you mix the resin, it will pop out the first 10, 12 times, but after that, it starts sticking. The little coat that's, that's covering this will start wearing away, and it will start getting a little rough. So I, I, rec I always use release even when they're brand new. And what it does, it extends, it extends the life of that, of that uh, pot. I mean, excuse me, of that mold. I use these constantly. So it's not, it's not a one-time use and toss it, yes. Is it a spray? It is. It's, uh, it's called uh, the Alumilite version. Well, the one they sell, I think it's called Stoners. It, it's... It works very well. It, it, uh, it, it's silicone based, so if you do flat work, spray it outside because you're going to be, if you're doing it in your garage and you have all your nice wood hanging on the walls, you're going to have silicone, and then when you start finishing something that you made from that wood, you're going to wonder what happened to the wood. So it does contaminate everything around it, so I, I just, I open the garage door, put a you know, a, a box outside, spray all my molds, you know, once every couple of days, bring them back in. Um, but I, I try not to spray in the shop because of the, the silicone going everywhere. Um, you can also use this kind of mold, okay, which is individual molds. Um, they have their advantages. You know, you, when you do individual blanks, you don't have to cut them to size, okay. That, you know, you get them out of here, put them on, you know, square them, put them on the lathe and start turning. If you're, if you're making block um, block blanks, okay, you have, once it's cast, you have to cut them somewhere on the bandsaw or on the table saw to cut them to size so that you can turn them. Now, I have numbers in the back of these, these little tick marks, and that's, every time I use this mold, I, I, I give it, I make a tick mark. I, I need to get a hundred iterations out of this block in order for it to, to meet my, my, my business plan, okay? If I get less than that and then I'm losing, uh, I'm, 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 my cost per blank increases. If I get m more than 100, then my cost per blank decreases, okay? Um, same thing with these for the larger blocks. I have them, you know, I, I do tick marks on every time I use it. I make a tick mark, and I, I do a little five slash, so it's easier for me to count from 5, 10, 15, 20. But I do this one. Uh, this one is fairly new. Uh, it, you know, this was the previous mold that I had in here went through that many, so I got a little bit over 100, about 118 uh, iterations out of it. Now, it's still usable after, after 100 plus iterations. The problem is the silicone starts getting a little rough and starts sticking to the block. So it might take me an extra two minutes to remove the block from the mold. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're doing 56 iterations in one day, that's two plus hours of time that you're spending banging, you know, uh, this on, on the floor or whatever to remove it. In addition to that, you'll start losing little bits and pieces of it, which transfers to the, to the, to the actual block that you cast. And the machining, it increases the time on machining because now it's not level. Your joiner doesn't want to play. It, it just, so once I start getting really rough uh, edges, I send it to the recycling bin. I don't know if it's recyclable, but that's where it goes. Um, any questions on molds? You could pretty much use anything. Okay, it depends on how much resin you want to waste. You know, if you're going to make a bottle stopper and you use this, you know, you'll get a bottle stopper blank out of it. You're just going to have a lot of shavings, okay? But we're all turners, right? That's the whole point of, of turning is to create shavings. So, it's more fun. Um... I, I've I used one, I've, I've used three different uh, versions. I use, I, and I even use Vaseline Petroleum Jelly. It works. It's just messy. Um, I like, sto it's kind of one of those, I, I, it's cost efficient. It works every time, so I stick to stoners. But they have other, Hobby Lobby's got one, I can't remember what the brand is, which works. Um, uh, but I order stoners 
from Illumilite Direct with my order. So it, it's all one shipment. And I don't have to leave the house to go looking for it. And it's, I've tested it. I like it. Um, so I stick to it. So that my molds don't stick to the resin. Anyway. The uh, <laughs> pigments, dyes, and, and glitters, okay? I buy these by... by by at minimum by the pound, okay, anywhere from it could be batches from from one pound to five pounds to ten pounds, depending on what the source is and depending on the price. The the if if you buy Pearl X, I, I think they're up to I don't know, like nine bucks a little, you know, the three quarter ounce now. I, I, they're pretty expensive. So if you tr if you buy Pearl X by the little three-quarter ounce jar, a pound of that is going to cost you a couple hundred bucks, okay? So buying in bulk um, uh, makes it more economical. But if you're only making one blank, there's no point in buying one pound of a, of a specific color. So, you know, Pearl, Pearl X works great. There are a lot of other... Uh, TKB is another company. Truth, Knowledge, and Beauty, I think, is what they stand for. Um, they sell a decent product at a decent price. Um, the, the prices on pigments and on resin have gone up this year easily. My, my resin has gone up almost 30% in the, in the last 18 months. So it, it's gotten, it's, it's going up, and, and it, that's if I can find it. So, you know, I, I place an order way ahead of time because now it's taken sometimes up to three weeks to get the orders in. They, don't, they can't get the raw materials for all the resins, so I, I get it whenever you know, they, they can fill in the order. Um, but you can use the pigments, yes. Yes. <laughs> my, my, it, it, it does. It does work. Eyeshadow is just mica compressed, okay? So if you, I, I put it in a, uh, in a, <laughs> I put it in a coffee grinder, and it, it, it worked. It pulverized the, 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 the eyeshadow, the coffee grinder was never the same ever again, okay? Um, but, but Mike is pretty much, that sometimes they add like, uh, like rice powder to it to, to make it more cakey, but it, it's just compressed mica powder. So it, it, it works, it's just, you know, for, for me it's easier to scoop it out than to, you know, take a little and, you know. Um, you also have, I, I like the Illumilite dyes. These work very well. They're made or they're sold by Illumilite for Illumilite. Um, you can also use the trans tint dyes. Now these, I believe these are alcohol based. I'm not sure. So, so they, yeah, so they do, you can't mix water and Illumilite. I said it. Okay. However, these may have some water or some alcohol in them and if you're using a, a, a pressure pot um, with enough pressure, you should you can use these and avoid uh, the micro bubbles. And I'll hide it now. Okay. Um, I also have uh, glitter. Okay, you can use glitter. Now, don't don't go to Hobby Lobby and buy their their you know their 25 micron glitter because. Uh, it's either going to float or it's either going to sink. You're not going to have a, a, a distribution of the glitter inside the resin. You have to look for glitters that are a micro fine. They are micro fine. They're really, really, really small um, to the point where the density of the resin is going to keep them from sinking. So by the time, if you're using alumilite, by the time the resin starts hardening, the the uh, the the little bits of glitter haven't, haven't descended to the bottom of the mold, and so therefore they stay suspended within the resin, okay? If you're using bigger pieces of uh, uh, you know, glitter from, uh, of, bigger, of a bigger size, by the time the, the resin gets hard, they're going to sink to the bottom, and you're going to have a nice little piece that you can make a, a little cup thingy. Um, but it's not going to be distributed for a pen blank, okay? So you can use glitters, you can use the micas. You have they have a flat, uh, not like clay-based micas, um, which give you flat colors. They're not the pearlescent colors that the micas give you, but they're a little bit more uh, more trying on the on your tools. Like if you're cutting a lot of blanks on the on the bandsaw or the table saw, um, they're going to stress that blade a little more, okay? They're going to dull it. The um, how much, how, how much dye and how much P 
pigment, the powder do you put in the mix? As a, as, as a general rule of thumb, okay, I use one gram of mica per ounce of resin. So if I'm making a, a 36 ounce um, block of resin, which is about this size right here, okay, that's about roughly 36 ounces of resin, um, I'll use about 30 to 36 grams of, of, uh, of mica pigment. Now, that's a lot. Some people say you don't need that much. You can, you know, if, if you put five grams into that, you'll have the color. And that's true. When you look at the block, you will, you know, use purple mica, you're going to see a purple block. The problem is when you cut that, when, when you cut that, uh, that block up, there's going to be a lot less... Uh, a lot less mica when you look through the blank and then as you turn it um, because you only leave that that very thin film on a pen there's going to be a lot less of that mica suspended in that resin so although it might look purple you know if you use five grams by the time you turn it you're going to have a blank that possibly you can see the brass tube behind it some people find that as as i don't know an interesting thing but a lot of people don't like to see the brass okay now here are some samples, and I'll pass these around. These are all using um, pigments, okay? Now, y you can look at these when you see them. That, that's about, that's paper thin right there, okay? And, and you can't, if you put a, a pen tube behind it, you're not going to see the tube. So, is one gram per, let me pass that around, is one gram per ounce too much? Maybe it is, but I, I, I've never had a customer come back and tell me, hey, I can see the brass tube. Okay, so that's a starting point. Depending on the, on the brand, depending on, on the mix, depending on the color, the darker the color, you can cut back on that amount. Okay, but the only way you're going to figure that out is by, uh, by making, you know, doing the mixes and at the same time taking good notes. I used, you know, one gram per ounce of this pigment and you cut a slice like that and if you can't see through it, well, next time, you, you know, use a little less and over time, uh, depending on the brand and depending on the color, you can decide if you need more or less of the of the pigment. Okay, uh, alumalite dye. I use ten drops per ounce. Again, if it's uh, if it's a uh, if it's a thirty four ounce block, I get coffee and I and I sit there, and your <laughs> and your and your forearm is going to get tired. So switch to the other one. Uh, <laughs> The, the key is take good notes. Now, the, 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 the tip for this bottle, okay, every time I refill it or I get another bottle, I use that same tip. And the reason is because if, if you use a new tip every time, you're going to have a new hole. And if you make a new hole, the, that drop is going to be smaller or larger. You, you can't control that, okay? So, so by using the same tip... For that same color every time, I, I consistently put in the same amount of, of th the drop, I guess the drop of, of, of color is consistently the same size over time. And because I make, um, I make blanks for commercial sellers, I need to make sure that when they order a specific color, you know, if they order it last, they ordered it last year and they order it next year, it has to be the same color. It, there can't be a whole lot of, of variance from the colors. Yes, sir. Yes, but you waste you waste too much by putting this in the syringe. Um, then you're gonna have to either clean the syringe or pour it back in here. You, you know, there's time in, involved, and, and then you're gonna waste a lot of, waste a lot of product because you're not gonna get all of the dye out of the syringe. And and well, you can leave it in the syringe, um, but if you if you leave it in the syringe, it might it might you know absorb some some moisture, and that's gonna that might cause problems uh, when you're mixing the resin. Okay, so yes, you can, but you know, it, it to me, it's just one more step. I'm I'm not willing to take. I use a very small, it's a lettered um, drill bit that I use for the holes, and I use that same bit for for every one of the of the bottles. So I like to say that that the drops are consistently the same size. Yes. It, it depends. Okay, a lot of them are a lot, especially the the clay-based ones or the flat-colored ones. Um, they tend to to be, to mix less. They they tend to uh, to clump up. 
Okay, now, I don't mix by hand. I have a, 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 a DIY mixer that I made, um, and, and I plug it in, and I, I have uh, mixes that'll, that'll be turning. This, this cup fits in that mixer, okay? And it's, it, it's got six stations, so I can mix six colors at the same time. It's, I think it does like 30 RPMs is what, what it's doing. So that cup is turning there at 30 RPMs, and I can leave it there indefinitely. Some of, these, uh, some of the, the, the pigments I've, I have to leave for 20 minutes just because they, 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 they clump up and they won't mix. So by, and if I mix it really, really fast, what happens is now those clumps are, are going to absorb um, more air in them. And then when I put them in the, in the pot, what's going to happen is when I compress that air, they're going to drop to the bottom. And now I have all these freckles of unmixed uh, mica in the bottom of the mold. Okay, so I have not found a, a mica powder that I have, have not been able to mix. But some of them are a little uh, challenging. Uh, ultramarines, for example, they, they tend to be clumpy. Um, and, and you can agitate them all you want. Um, and, and when you leave the, the let the, the resin sit, they're either going to float or they're going to go to the bottom. And you find out when you're pouring, and then you see that last clump of, and, and it's already in the mold. And because it's denser than the, than the resin that's already in the mold, it's going to find its way to the bottom. Um, if, you, if you pour oversized, well, you can cut that piece off if it reaches all the way to the bottom. If it stops halfway and the resin sets, there's going to be a blank in there with this uh, you know, raw p glob of, uh, of mica in there. For personal use, no big deal. You know, you'll drill it out, refill it. But for what I do, I can't, I can't risk... If I have a block that I pull out of the mold and it has freckles in the bottom, it goes into the... It's, I'm going to shred it later or do something with it later pile because it's, it's, it's more expensive to me to ship it and then the vendor sells it, and then the customer complains to the vendor, the vendor's gonna complain to me, and I have to replace that product that he has to replace, it's just a big mess. So it's easier for me to look at it if I'm not happy with it, it goes into the uh, recycle bin um, for later use or, or, or something else. But I don't, I don't put the product, I try not to put the product out um, because it just causes too much trouble. But, but it, you can mix them. The ultramarines are challenging if, they're, if, the, if the content of titanium dioxide, which al most micas have uh, titanium dioxide in there, uh, if the content of titanium dioxide is high, um, they also tend to be a little bit problematic for, for mixing. Any other questions on the pigments? Okay, the uh, pouring techniques, okay? You'll have people that, that they'll, they'll pour and then they get a, a popsicle stick and they do a figure eight and they go side by side. The more you play with the resin, the muddier the colors are going to be. Okay? So if, 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 you, if you pour it in there um, and the green is at the top, in there the, the resin is already doing something. Leave it alone. Pour it. Leave it alone. Okay? The resin is smarter than we are. The resin is doing its own thing. If you start using a popsicle stick, you're, what you're doing is you're mixing all those colors, um, and, and, and instead of getting blue with purple and yellow, now you, you get mud. Okay, and then you wonder, why, why is, you know, I, I poured slow, yeah, I did this, I did that. Why are my colors not separating? Pour it in the mold and leave it alone. Okay, and, and, and most of the time, the resin is going to do the right thing. Sometimes, you know, you make an ugly blank, you know, and just... Call it an ugly blank and do another mix, okay? Um, shallow pours. You can do a shallow pour, okay? Um, for shallow pours, what I do is, and when I say shallow pour, it's, it's going to be a, a, a fairly under one inch, okay? Thick blank or block. What happens with shallow pours is you don't have, you don't have the three-dimensional view to it because the resin is going gonna, is gonna to hit there and just going to go to the side. So it can't, it, it can't really travel a whole lot. So if, if, you, if you go like this and you pour it, okay, the resin is going to go... The resin is going to... This is the mold right here. The resin is going to come in here and then just go that way, this way, and up. And then when it hits the wall here, it's going to do this on you. So it just becomes a very kind of flat-looking... Uh, uh, 
you're not going to get a whole lot of color separation. So what you want to do is you want to break this pore right here. You want to break that, that motion so that the resin, when it, hits the, when it hits the mold, it slows down. Okay, if you do this, it's going to move in there really fast. The faster it moves in the mold, the more it's going to mix and you get mud. Okay, so the way to do that is you use something to stop the momentum of the resin. I use these little things. They don't fit in there. Yeah. Okay, so what it does, it sits right there on that mold right there. So when I'm pouring the resin, I pour the resin on top of this right here. What that does is the resin is going to hit this. It stops the momentum, and now it's going to pour from different places into the mold versus just two points. So I don't have now two streams of resin mixing. I have six or eight or ten different streams of resin going in different directions. So they hit the mold in different directions and they'll move in different directions versus all going in one motion. Okay. Uh, the other thing you can do is, is, yeah, right there. This is a shallow mold. It's only about an inch. Oh, this is, this, this is, uh, High tech. It's just basically those pieces I, I passed around earlier, the little, the little thicker ones than that, I just put those on bamboo, bamboo skewers, just place them on top and then pour the resin there. So I, I reuse those things again and again. Okay. These little dots? No, those, that's when the, what happens is when, I, uh, when you pour the resin, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come off the edges. So as it sets, it's going to leave those little nipples hanging from, from the edges. And eventually those things will grow. I mean, I've had some that are, you know, an inch, three quarters of an inch. And I do. And, and, th and they become the, the mud eye kind of little eye things. So they, what happens is you'll have, got the camera there, you'll have these little thingies hanging like that. I'll snip them off. Um, when they grow and then I'll use that to make more blanks now this is you know I've used this one maybe two or three times this one here maybe 30 or 40 times this one here it's got several hundred pores on it okay just to make you know a bigger now this one is w this is what I cut uh, to make the mudite blanks I take and it's just basically layer upon layer this one maybe it's visible here you can see all the layers in there. Yeah. No, I sell it as mudite. <laughs> but but this one right here is this is about two and a half pounds of resin that's been poured. You know, it started off like this here, and right now it's got about two and a half inches thickness. Okay, about two and a half pounds, I'd say. This is what I cut up and make other stuff with it now again I, I just I found that out by accident after I used this once I was throwing them away and I said well I can use them twice I can use them a couple hundred times and then you know I got this this hunk of, of resin out of it um, with the price of resin anywhere I can save a little bit of resin it's worth it for me right the it just gives me this one here it gives me a, a it gives more more uh, streams of resin going into the mold. If I put just one big one, you, all you have is a, a block. You, you can, yeah. You just have to make them thinner um, and you can fit three in there. If you, make it, if you make one, if you make it round, you make it triangular, you get all kinds of different mixes on it. So this, this block here, that's the, that's his, this is the top of the block, okay? Right there, you can see, and, and, and those what looks like bubbles are actually bubbles. When I mix the resin, poured it in the blank, they came to the top, the, the pressure collapsed them, they froze in place, um, and now they just look like little fish eyes. If you look at the bottom of the blank, you can see that this blank here, for example, had five different streams of resin going in. So the resin hit these spots here and started moving in different direction. If I, if I would have just used two cups, and it would have been one stream, and what, it, what would have happened is you would have seen a line here, and then it just, it, it, you wouldn't have the color separation. It'd just be kind of a lot more mixed. So as you do this, how do you make the same appearance in the board? <coughs> you used to do this. No. But how do you repeat the, 
The, like I said, the resin does its own thing. If, you, if you're using the same motion um, and, and the same distance and the same technique every time, the resin will generally do the same thing. Now, no, no two blanks are ever the same. I mean, I, I make several, I make thousands of blanks every year, and, and if I were to cut them all and line them up from the same colors, you will never see the same pattern. The, the resin is, is just... It's like pouring water. It just it'll do its own thing. So the color mixes and the swirls and the ratios are the same. If I use, for example, purple, yellow, and green, when I mix those three colors over time, I'm gonna get the same ratio. You know, same amount of, of, of the three colors in all three in, in in throughout the whole block, but the swirls are gonna be completely different. Okay? Now for SWAT, for example, what happens is throughout the year I make, I, you know, I, I make blocks and I cut them and every once in a while I'll have one block that just doesn't fit the normal pattern. And, and normally they look a lot better than what it was supposed to look like. And, I, and then I try to go back, what did I do different? How can I repeat that? Forget about it, it's not going to happen. So, so, what happens, <laughs> so what happened with those blocks, because it doesn't fit the catalog colors, I, it goes on the shelf and then as SWAT, is getting closer. Those are the ones that I cut up and I take to SWAT because they don't fit the... So SWAT gets the cream of the crop. They, they get the, the best mixes that I make throughout the year um, go to SWAT because I can't put them... I can, I can sell them if I, if I do individual ads in, in Facebook, but I can't sell them to the website because they're, they don't fit a specific color. So to answer your question, you can't, you can't get the same patterns. I cannot get the same patterns. I can get the same color mixes, the same ratios, um, the same size of, of the swirls, but, uh, but there's no way I can get the same pattern. That was a shallow pour, okay? Um, oh, the other thing, I, uh, on the shallow pour, what you can do is as you're pouring, if you don't want to use the, the, you know, this little thingy here to, to break the momentum, what you can do is then just move the cup low uh, on, on the mold and just move it rather quickly left and right. What happens is you're going to have a thin layer of resin coming out of it and it doesn't have enough time, it doesn't have a lot of weight so it doesn't sink. So you create like a graffiti looking uh, blank and, and when it hardens, you'll, you'll like, depending on how you cut it, you can, you can see the lines um, going uh, you know, throughout the blank. Um, deep pours, okay, when I say deep is anything more, any two inches or more, okay. This gives you a more three-dimensional kind of blank because the, the resin moves flat and it also moves in this direction, okay. So as, it, as it's on, on the shallow ones, because it only has about an inch to travel, when it hits the top, it's just going to move in this direction. So you have flat moving in the bottom, flat moving in the top, and a little bit of a vertical movement in the center of that block. Okay, for the for the deeper ones, um, before that that resin rises to the top and starts moving laterally again, you're gonna you're gonna get veins of of different uh, colors throughout that blank. And and the difference is that's a blank. This is a deep blank. There you can see as the stream of resin came in here. It, it came over here and it stopped right there. For what reason, I don't know. And then that same stream moved in this direction and created this area over here. So the, 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 deep, the deep pores will give you movement in this direction. You can see the flat movement here, plus it'll give you this vertical movement that you can see over here. I, I don't cast, regularly I don't cast anything less than, than two inches. This is the smallest block that I, that I cast just because I like to see that, that three-dimensional uh, movement of the resin. This is another example right here. Okay, and, and earlier I was talking about pour the resin and let it do what it wants to do. Okay, and, and this is a, a, a good example. I poured the resin and the blue was at the top. Now, I, I wanted to have some of the yellow and some of the gold in that block, so I'm going to take a popsicle stick and start moving that resin, and now I created what's blue and yellow? I don't know, brown, right? If you're patient, okay, when you cut the blank, you know, that's the color right there. So if you look at the, if you, if you look at the surface of that block right there, it looks kind of, kind of, but once you cut into it, if, if you don't mess with the resin, you get that color separation. Now, 
every block that I make is oversized. And the reason I'm making them oversized is because I can cut slices. If, if the bottom, for example, is really flat, I can slice off a, a quarter of an inch off of that block and, and pull that color out. So I, I can do that. Normally, the, the eighth of an inch from the top and eighth of an inch from the bottom of that block is just, mm, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just doesn't have that, that bang to it, okay? Now, when you turn it, if you turn a pen, you're going to pull that out. The problem is when you put that photo on the website and say, hey, I have this blank to sell, this is what people see. And when people see that, they're like, it's a blue blank. I don't want a blue blank. I want, you know, I want, this is what I want. It's in there. Um, so I cast oversized. So when I shave the, the ends off of the blocks, I'm, I'm able to show this so the customer can, can get a, a pretty decent picture of what they're going to, to receive when they make that purchase. Okay. Um, layered and timing, okay? Alumilite, you, cannot, you can't pour alumilite on top of alumilite because it doesn't stick, okay? That's alumilite on top of alumilite on top of alumilite on top of alumilite, okay? And that's, I don't know, maybe a sixteenth of an inch thick. It sticks. The problem is you can't if you're going to do something like that, you can't let the alumilite cure completely, okay? If it cures com completely, um, the other layer might not stick to it. So, for, for the, clear, the clear slow, normally at about the 30 minute, I depressurize it and I pour the next color in there. And then I pressurize it again, and then at about the th 30 minute mark, it's, it's solid enough that it's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna let the, the bubbles expand again, but it's still kinda, kinda sticky, so when you pour the next layer on top of it, it sticks to it, it's still kinda melted. If you let it cure, it creates this, almost like an oil, oily film on top of it, and when you pour that next layer on top of it, you're gonna snap it right off. So it can be done, you just have to, you, that's all you're doing that day. Drinking coffee and making a layered block. Because if you're doing anything else, it's not going to work. And, and, and the sad part about it is that sometimes I've made these mixes with, you know, 20 different layers. And all it takes is one layer that doesn't stick to ruin the block. So when I, when I do this and I cut them into pen blanks, and then I take each blank and I, and I do one of these and see if it, if it snaps. If it snaps, that whole block is gone. I'm not, if one blank from that block snaps, the whole, the whole block is condemned. I use it for other things. I cut it up, I'll shred it, I'll, I'll use it as paperweights, but um, so I don't toss it, but if one block fails, the whole block, I, I can assume that the whole block is gonna fail, okay? Um, mixed media. You can pretty much put anything into a Lumalite that stays still for at least 10 minutes. Okay, if it stays still, you can put it in a lumilite as long as it's dry. Okay, now what dry means, for example, wood. If you if you dry it in the oven, okay, and then you pull it out of the oven and you sit it on the bench for several hours, it's going to reabsorb moisture. Okay, um, wormy wood, for example, everybody likes to fill all those wormholes with with uh, with resin, and they look beautiful. Problem is, a worm made that hole. And sometimes that worm is still somewhere in that hole. So if you, you look at the hole and you clean it, and it looks fine, and you put it in resin, and the worm happens to still be sleeping in there, you're going to have this big bubble coming out of, the, out, of the, out, of, out of the block, okay? Now, you kill the worm, but I don't think that was the purpose. It was to fill in the void, um, so you're going to have to, you know, redo it. Okay, so when you're when you're casting uh, wormy stuff, I, I would recommend with a Dremel tool dig out those, you know, use your your compressed air and blow in those holes. Toothpicks, you can fish those little suckers out of there. <laughs> Hook them up and pull them out. Um, sometimes they're a lot bigger than what the hole looks like. I don't. I think they expand that. I guess they get fat while they're in the in the hole. Um, but make sure there's nothing in there. Any vegetation, any moss. Um, any any kind of insect that's in that in that uh, in that block is going to affect the, the the way the resin sets. Any 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 droppings, um, termites. I've done termites, and and the, ter the termite droppings are really it's almost like sand, but it has moisture in it because I ruined some resin like that. Um, so 
you can pretty much anything that stays still, as long as it's dry, you can put it in resin. And if you're mixing alumilite with, with anything other than just alumilite, I, I recommend 100% to use pressure um, because there's just, there are too many opportunities for air to get inserted into that mix. Okay? Any questions so far? I do not. And, and the reason is I, I cast a little bit higher pressure than, than the Hobby 80 PSI Binks pot. So I, if, now not all woods um, absorb the resin at, at the same rate. Some woods, it doesn't matter how much pressure you put on them, it's not going to take, it's not going to penetrate. So stabilizing is your only option. But woods like, for example, uh, uh, spalted hackberry, pecan, I can get a, I'd say close to 100% penetration just with the Lumilite resin at the right pressure. And it, it's more than the 80 PSI that, uh, um, for these tanks. It just, it takes a lot more pressure. I don't, I don't, now that I, I'll soon, I am soon to have a new shop, I, I do, I am looking forward to setting up a, a corner of it for stabilizing, just for fun. Um, but as of right now, I, it just, I don't have the space to do stabilizing. So I don't stabilize. But like I said, not all woods will absorb the resin. Um, you'll put it in there and it'll create a nice layer over it, but it doesn't penetrate the wood. Any other questions? Well, I, I, um, I, I don't think, I, I think it's the, 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 how the structure of the wood is. Because I've had some, some very solid uh, spalted pecan um, absorb it, you know, through and through. I've cut the blank, you know, just to make sure that it went all the way through, and it has. And I've had other uh, very punky um, spalted hackberry, for example, that it, it just settled on the layer. It's almost, it's almost like too spongy, and it just kind of sat on top of it, but it didn't penetrate at all. So if you're going to stabilize, I would recommend using stabilizing solution. You know, cactus juice is, is one that a lot of people use, a lot of people like. I've used it before. It works. So if it's stabilizing that you're doing, you know, stick with that. that that'll, yes. In oily woods, Cocobolo, for example, Paduke, those woods tend to be a little bit more finicky. Even walnut. You take a piece of very light walnut and try to stabilize it with, uh, with alumilite resin, and it won't, it won't penetrate. Why, I don't know. Any other questions? Okay, so what I'm going to try to do now is I'm going to mix, I'm going to do a quick mix here. Give me camera two. I have a, it, it's a granulator. It's a big machine. It's, it's not meant to, to shred plastic, um, but you, have you seen those YouTube videos where they put a car into this thing and it, it kind of, it, it's just not a benchtop version of that, but it's a, a home garage version of that. It's, it, I'm sure OSHA would be all over it if they see it. Cut this off the video. So I, I'm sure it's not... <laughs> I'm sure it's not OSHA approved by any means. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, when I use it, I, you know, I, I tell the wife, I don't want anybody in the garage, it's just me. If you hear a... <laughs> so the, so yeah, what, what happens is I put that in, in, in that machine and, and it, it shreds it. And then I, you know, but it, it doesn't do it, for example, I won't get this size from the first time. It'll, it'll shred into the bucket, then I take that bucket and just the, the little sifting thing on it, put, the, put it back in there, and, and over time, you know, three or four times running it through the machine, I'll get that size there. So if I'm doing a lot of shredding, what I do is I sift it all, and then I'll, I'll have blanks with bigger chunks and with smaller chunks, and then the pulverized version of it, because in, in one shredding, you'll get all three versions of it. Did I dance enough around that one? Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to do a very, a very quick resin mix. This right here is, uh, this is the postal scale. This thing, I, it's got to be 20 years old. It, uh, yeah, it, 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 it works, okay? So this, this one here is the gram scale. I use this one when I'm, when I'm, when I'm weighing the, the pigments. Okay, like I said, one gram per ounce. Um, I have at least three of these in the shop at any given time. And the reason is because 
although I put tape over this here, if I, if I drop a cup of resin on this thing, it's done. It's not going to work anymore. Like I just did there. You see that? That's an example of how easy you can. So what I do is I, I keep, I keep uh, a couple of these <laughs> as backup because if, if I ruin, and I've ruined two in one day. In less than one hour, I ruined two of these. Pulled one out of the box, and within 20 minutes, it was done. And once I pour resin on it, I just throw it away because it's not, there's no alcohol and no acetone that's going to remove the amount of resin that gets into these little nooks and crannies here. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm sorry. This is RC3, RC3 tan. Okay, this is the this is the flat version of of the RC3. It it comes out as an ivory color. You won't get the pearlescent color. You won't get the the the, the shimmering anything. It's just flat. It's like mixing paint. Okay. It is. It is. It's called a. I guess the, they rebranded it as a Lumi Res RC3 black, but it's not black. It's tan. If I put it this way, I can see. <coughs> yeah. Say again. Yeah. Music, please. <laughs> yeah, I do that 20 or 30 times. So I'm gonna do. We're gonna do a shallow. So this one will be about 18, about 18 ounces. Okay. So I'm gonna use four and a half ounces. Of B, and four. I'm gonna mix two colors, so it'll be four and a half ounces, four and a half ounces, and then I put the other four and a half ounces, and that's nine per cup, which is 18 ounces for this mold. Now, the manufacturer tells you to pour A, and then to pour B. I don't follow the manufacturer's instructions because the resin. If I use A first it's going to stick to the cup. And as you can see, these are very expensive Dollar General cups that I use again and again and again. I don't, I don't use disposable just because save the world or whatever, or I'm cheap and, and I don't want to uh, spend more money. These cups I could use 30, 40 mixes before it starts sticking and I have to get rid of them, okay? So now, okay, I have... Sea blue, red, green, and yellow. Which colors do we want? Two colors. Blue and yellow. Okay, so I have six ounces. I'm going to use, I mean, four and a half ounces. I'm going to use 45 drops. Okay? That's 10, 20, 30, 40, 5. And we want the. Uh, Okay, I have blue. And this one, the same thing. 45. One, two, three, four, and five. You get up with a cramp in your hand, you can't it, when you're counting, I mean, you're, this muscle here will go to sleep. I do this, and I drink coffee, and, uh, and it just it gets annoying. So, it... Uh, I've calculated. You, yeah, but but if you're off by a quarter of a gram, that could be 30, 40 drops right there. So I just with with this resin with this because it's a flat resin, using a little bit more, a little bit less. Really, if you use too much less, it's noticeable. If you use too much more. If that's proper, you're not gonna. It's not gonna get any more yellower. Once it gets yellow, it's it. it you could put a lot more. It's just gonna look yellow. But if you use less, then you need to reach that yellow color, and then it's just gonna look like a pale, sick, somebody threw up color. All right. I don't know. My my English is not good looking. So, <laughs> is the camera able to see that there? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to pour the A. All right, so I'm going to go with four and a half ounces. So now I have, trust me on this one, I'm going to have nine ounces here. And this resin sits in a, sets in about three minutes. So by, by this time, somebody's already panicking. Oh, my God, I got to, you know, I got to 
I got to mix it. I got to pour it and I got to pressurize it. Today we're not going to put it in the tank just so you can see how it goes from mm to actual color. So what will happen at, at, in the shop, this cup now goes into the mixer, okay, and that turntable is going to be turning and this stick is on a static thingy and, and, and this cup is just going to be turning and it's just going to be at 30 RPMs by itself, okay. For this resin, it's not a big deal, but for those pigments that tend to be clumpy, um, if I were to mix it by hand, it'd be almost impossible. So this is, and as you can see, it's a nice brown color. So I'm mixing brown with brown. And I can, I can pretty much tell um, a lot of people use thermometers, the, the little laser thermometers. I can, by holding the cup, I can, I can tell when it's getting to that point where I have to pour it. Um, so I have a calibrated left hand. <laughs> this one, it, it could go up to about, a, I think about 150. Well, no, no. When, when, when I pour at about, this one at about the 90 degree, 95 degree is when, when I pour it. When it's the, when it's the, the, the the clear slow, I, I can go right by 100, but at that point, you're rushing it a little bit to get into the tank. But above 90, the, the hotter it gets, the more color separation you're going to get. Um, but it's going to depend on the time of year, too. In, if, in the winter, you get a little bit more time to play with it. In, in the Texas heat, it, it sets really, really fast. So here, I'm going to pour one color, and that's the blue. Trust me. And this is the yellow. <laughs> you can see now it's green. Yeah. And notice I'm not pouring in one spot. Okay, I'm going to put those there. I'm going to take this off so you can actually see when the color changes. Normally, I leave that there. And then the little drops that are coming, the little droplets, it's what becomes those little hangy thingies. And now you take the popsicle stick and just throw it in there, go crazy. And you get mud. Okay, so leave it alone. Um, the resin is going to do its own thing. Every time. It'll... This one, like I said, it, it'll, it'll set in about three minutes. So while that, just keep an eye on the camera just to, to, to. Again, this, this mix is going to be just kind of flat. It's, you're not going to get the three-dimensional. You'll get a little bit of it, but not a whole lot. If I would have poured it without that little platform thing, it would be even flatter. Okay, because again, like I said, the, the colors are going to go... This is the mold. The colors are going to go in there, move in this direction, hit the wall, and then they're going to start doing this. And then the same thing over here. So what ends up happening, you end up with curls on one end, curls on the other end, and then the center here, when these move in this direction, that's where you got a lot of the mixed colors. So you end up with a very flat blank there, very flat there, and then over here, this center right here, is what's going to end up looking... Uh, three-dimensional this this one here is going to be flat this one here is going to be flat if you take a block um, this block for example I'll cut into six blanks what happens is it'll the 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 two blanks from the extremes and the part of the bottom and the top is just kind of flat you're not going to get a whole lot of movement the four the four blanks from the center are going to have or, you know this type of movement in there if I were to pour without the platform. By using the platform, what's happening is now I'm saving those two end blanks that in the past would just kind of look kind of blah. Now I get a full six blocks um, from that, blanks from that block. They, they, they're, they work. I mean, they, they uh, to me, it's just more, to me, it's, it's just one more step. I can, it's easier for me to mix six different colors on my mixer and then just rotate the colors in and out than, than try to 
to mix the different colors and pour it into that cup and then pour that into the you know into the mold and and the other the other uh the other reason that wouldn't work for me is because I, I make larger mixes, and I think those cups you can only use, you know, maybe three, four ounces per color. So if you're doing a, a you know, a 40, a 60, a 90 ounce pour, um, you're going to need a lot of those cups to be able, you know, to 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 to, to get 90 90 ounces of resin into a mold in a timely manner. Because if you have to mix it, then pour it in individual little cavities. Um, and then pour it into a mold, it, it's going to take some time. And as you can see, you know, that resin went from, you know, in, in about three minutes from liquid to, to resin. So if you're using this kind of resin, you don't have a whole lot of time to, to mix those colors in those cups. If you're doing smaller pours, it works great. You know, if you're using small, smaller pours, smaller quantities of resin, it, wor it works fine. To me, I like these cups. Um, and, and the main reason I like them is because, you know, once I mix the resin... That one right there has been used three or four times. Okay, all I got to do is do this. And anyway, and it'll come right out. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Don't use it to mix. <laughs> I've tried that. So, so this, you know, this is cured resin. If if you pour the A before you pour the B, what happens is this layer here is going to be tacky and sticky, okay? And it ruins the cup, and it, it, it just, you're, now you're full of resin, and you're looking for acetone and alcohol, and, and wherever you put this cup, you have the little red ring everywhere, okay? Your t-shirt, your hands, everywhere. So, to me, I use the A because it, I, I don't know the science behind it, nor do I care. The B sticks to the cup, and then when the A gets in there, it, it cures the whole thing, and I can just pull it out and reuse this cup. And a side benefit from that is you see these little thingies right here? You can peel them right out. And if you get enough of these, you can make this blank. Um, so this cup, the little things that hang from it, pull them out. Collect enough of these, and you can make a blank similar to this. So when I say nothing goes to waste, I mean, I, I look at the dust collector bag, I pull it out, and I look at it, and I'm like, wow. come on, come on, there's something in there, I know it, you know, but that's my limit right there. When it goes into the dust collector bag, it's, it's done, it's, it's out of there. So that, um, you can pass that one around so you can feel the heat. It's hard, but it's still, if I pull it out of the mold, it'll still be kind of a little flexible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to bring my little heat gun measuring thing, but... Okay, any other questions? Let me go over my pot real quick. I didn't do a, a pressurized version of this today, because I don't want to blow up a pot. But anyway, I use... I started casting with Binks, I'm sorry, with, with Harbor Freight pots. They're, everybody talks bad about those pots, you know. I've gone through at least 25 of those pots. When I started casting, I had seven or eight of them going on at the same time. They are finicky, okay, to set them up. They tend to leak. Um, they're not the best. I mean, you're paying $65, and if you use your little, you know, coupon, you're paying $55 for a, for a pressure tank. You're not going to get a Binks, okay? You're going to get a Harbor Freight tank. They work, okay? And they can be pressurized. The old versions, okay, the, the, the original ones that I got were the stamp on the lid said working pressure 80 PSI. Now I think they say 50, okay? So whatever, whatever that tank says, stick to that. My tank said 80. I was going at 80 PSI, and they will hold 80 PSI. I mean, if you have them properly sealed... Um, they will hold 80 PSI. The, the problem with pressure tanks is that you'll have the lid, and then you have the regulator, and then you have f three of these, and then you have, and you put so many connections. Every connection that you put on that lid is one opportunity, is another opportunity for air to escape, okay? So the less attachments you have on it, the less opportunity you have for that 
tank to leak, okay? This tank here only has this pressure release valve. This is where the air goes in, okay? I close it, I leave it alone, and when it's time to empty the pot, I release the air, okay? So air goes in there, air comes out through there, and then it's got a pressure gauge, okay? That's all it has. In the, in the inside, I have this little elbow here because as a demonstration, you can see these little, all this resin here. What happens if you don't have this here, the air shoots in here into your mold and it creates this really nice effect inside your tank, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> use this elbow because this will shoot it to the side, okay? And it doesn't mess with, uh, with the resin, okay? So that's all I have on this, on this lid. All right, that's it. Now, before the pressure gets to this, to this pot, it's regulated at the compressor and it's regulated at another, uh, what is it, a manifold? So it's regulated in two spots before it reaches over here. If you're using straight from the tank to the pot, I would say keep the regulator on. I'm not advocating to take the safety valve or the regulator off of this tank. I'm just saying that this is what I do, okay, because I have safety checks in, at two other levels, all right? And it gives me a lot less uh, problems as far as leaks. The other thing is that over here, it's got a handle that's about six inches tall. I, you know, get one of these at Lowe's and screw it in there, screws right in, make this little oak uh, turned custom handle here, put it in there. Yeah, I turned it square. Yeah, I just, I just killed the edges. Um, the tank, all right, this is my, my tank, and I'll put it here on camera too. As you can see, the tank has rice in the bottom okay the reason for the rice is twofold number one it absorbs some moisture okay if you have any moisture in the resin it'll absorb it not a whole lot okay the main reason i put the rice in there is because these these tanks when you when you're if it has a round a round bottom if you were to place a square uh, mold in there depending on, on if you're moving it farther this way or that way it's going to start doing this on you so if you're putting it, you're never going to get it flat just by laying it in there. Okay, number one. Number two is, depending on the surface you put this tank on, if the, if the surface is, is off, that's going to translate to the mold, which translates to the resin. Okay? If you're off by an eighth of an inch, okay, this one, the difference between here and here is going to be at least an eighth of an inch. Okay? If you're using exact amounts of resin, um, you're not going to get the full amount of blanks. You're going to get some skinny blanks over here and some fat ones down here, okay? So a level tank for me saves me a lot of money and saves me a lot of time because these blanks, um, once, once they get come out of, the, out of the mold, they get run through the joiner. Again, not OSHA approved. They get run through a joiner to, to clean one edge and then they get run through a drum sander to make them even, you know, even thickness. Okay, so if, 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 they're, if they're off by an eighth of an inch, that's five or six more passes that I got to put through the, through the drum sander just to, to, to level it out. Plus, I lose that much resin, okay? So level is important. And then this little platform here just sits on top of the rice. I put a level, and I won't level it. And if it's not level, I just take a, you know, I have a, one of those dead blow hammers, and I just kind of go like that. And it, once it's level, and then the mold goes in there, okay? So having a level tank, um, right now in my new shop, I'm going to have carts that I, I have the tanks lined up. I'm going to, once I fill the tanks, it's going to move under a bench just to save space. Every time I move that cart, it's going to be uneven. So when I pull it back out, it's, it's not going to be level, even if when I, when I pushed it in, it's gonna be, it was level. So every time I put a, 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 a mix inside the tank, I, I re-level it. It just, for some reason, you know, when I'm pulling out the, the block, I'll move this. The rice will shift with the pressure. Um, it's never level. So I always, now other folks, what they like to do is they like to take, you know, 30 ounces of resin and pour it in the bottom of the tank, and, and it'll naturally level the tank. As long as you always have that tank on that same surface. If you move it somewhere else, it's going to be off okay so for me a level tank saves me money saves me time um, and rice works great 
because it's it's almost like sand. You know, you can you can move it easily without having to. And in worst case, if if, if the if the rice isn't helping you, you can you know how every couple of weeks we get those those postcards with all those sales that you get on, on in the mail. Instead of tossing them, you fold them and you put them under these things here because these are not you know they're not machined flat. Some of them are a little bit off, so you'll have a little bit of rocking. Any questions on the tank? I have uh, I have a California five gallon. I have a, a an old calif not an old. Um, is it a California? The the if you just by looking at them, the California uh, air tool ones are li you can feel that the wall the metal is thinner. You can feel it. They I have one. It works fine. Um, it has a round bottom. I have an an older one. I think it's a California air tool one. It has a flat bottom. Okay, the first time I, I pressurized that tank, I, it had four little caster wheels. I put it on the bench, I leveled it, um, I pressurized it, and then when I went to take the pressure off, the the tank was rocking. I'm like, what happened here? When I looked at the tank, because it has a flat bottom, it had, it had the bottom had expanded enough that it was it was. It was lifting the casters off of the off of the bench. Now, I proceeded to leave the garage, get some coffee, and wait for the boom. I mean, I you know, it just didn't. It didn't. I thought I really thought something was going to happen. It just didn't seem normal that a, that a bottom of a tank would would you know bow like that, right? About an hour into it, nothing happened. I figured maybe it lost pressure. I walked back in the garage. It was still at 80 psi. And, and you know, I'm going the, like, this really helps. When you do this, it's going to blow, but you just do this, uh, you know. Anyway, that, yeah, that, that's what I did. I left the pressure out of it, and, and, and it flattened up again. It's, that's exactly my reaction. I'm like, what? So I, you know, then I, I, I just, I went 40 PSI, 50, and, and there is some movement in the bottom of that tank. What I did was I just elevated it, you know, put an, a little piece of, three-quarter inch wood under the casters to, to lift it up a little bit. I don't use that tank a whole lot because I, I'm still, it, it's, it's five or six years old. I've used it enough, but it's the last tank that I use. Um, if, I'm, if all my 14 tanks are busy, and, and that, then I'll fill that tank. But that's the last tank I fill, I leave the shop. I don't, I'm sorry? I think it's the, the Vlibis? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But it, it's an older tank. Yeah, but it, it, it says working pressure is 80 PSI for that tank. That's California tools. Yeah, those, those work. I just, the, the metal feels a little bit thinner. Um, I, this is steel. Yeah. Now, some people will say that the Binks tanks are made like tanks, <laughs> like war tanks, and, and that you can't dimple the, you know, the lid. If you use them enough, you put this camera back up. If you use them enough, you will, you will dimple. I mean, you'll get, you're going to get these dimples. This tank, it's got to have, I don't know, a couple thousand iterations. So you, you will eventually get these. Then uh, eventually what you do is you just flip them, you know, turn them a quarter of a turn, and then use a new spot after about the 10-year mark, if you get there, okay? Um, when you set up the tank, you can see these little tick marks I have here. <coughs> Even the Binks tanks, you know, when you set them up, some of them may still leak through the, through the gasket, okay? And, and dust, I mean, this little welding they do here, it might leak. So before, before you go buy a new gasket, which is, they're pretty expensive for the Binks tanks, just, you know, move it around a little bit and, you know, reattach the clamps and repressurize it. And then once you reach that sweet spot where it's pressurized and it's not losing any air, put some tape on it and make a tick mark and then every time you put that lid on that tank you put it in the same position it should not leak. I have never I have never had a leak from a from a Binks tank the well one time and it was that I had for some reason a grain of rice actually came out of there at some point and stuck to the to the gasket so when I put it on I you know I did everything and it started leaking um, through that one side and, and with Alumolite, once you pressurize it, you don't have time to depressurize, clean the gasket, and, and repressurize it. It's going to set by the time you do that. So 
use a clamp and hold the pressure down. <laughs> it's not going to blow, but you know, it'll, it, if it keeps enough pressure in it, it'll save the block. But you don't have enough time to, to empty it, you know, depressurize it, clean it up, and put the lid back on and screw it back on. So, um, and in Lumalite, some people say you only need 40 PSI. If you're doing straight resin, that, that should work. If you're mixing other stuff in it, I would, I would say you know, at least 60 PSI, if, if not 80, if your tank is, is rated for that. I, every, every, every block that I cast is cast at 80 PSI or higher. I don't, I don't cast anything less than, than 80 PSI. Just because the tanks hold the pressure, I have three uh, different compressors that are moving air at any given time, um, so I use 80 PSI. And I don't have to change the regulator on the tanks. It's just set for 80. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I cook the cones. I mean, I literally cook the cones. You don't... Uh, the, the pine cones have resin in them. So if you heat, if you heat them um, no, 150 degrees, what you do is you just, you just heat it to resin. The, 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 the pine tar is what it's called. The tar in, in, in the... Um, in the pine cone, so all is once it it, it uh, once it cools down again, it's going to be sticky. You know, it doesn't really harden. Okay, now what I do is I cook the pine cones, and what that does, it cooks the resin and it hardens the, that that sap. Okay, it, it it's like uh, it 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 cures the sap. I guess is, is is what I would say. And and if if there is a little bit of sap in the pine cone. When it, it's mixed with alumilite, uh, number one, I don't get a reaction. Number two, when the customer's turning it, they're not going to feel a difference in, in, in the alumilite and that little bit of sap that's in, in the pine cone. So by cooking them, um, I, and I cooked them, I think, at 200 degrees for about six hours. They, they'll start, don't do it in, the, in your home oven because it's going to smell like Christmas in the house, okay? But the, uh, I bought a, a commercial lab oven. Um, and I cook them in there for about 200, 200, 250 degrees for about six hours. And that, what it does, it, it, it evaporates the, or dehydrates the resin, the sap, um, and it just hardens it. So you don't, you, don't get little, you don't get that little pocket of sap in there. Now, again, it, it, it's, I don't do one block. When I'm doing uh, pine cones, I'm, 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 you know, I'm cooking about 20, 30 pounds at a time. So I'll make a couple hundred blanks. Um, it's just not cost effective to do it for, for one mix. Because that oven pulls a lot of power. What, what I yeah these uh, I use the the pine cones that I use when 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 they're they're cooked you moved a lot of air out of it and you moved a lot of moisture out of it so it's uh, they're they become a little denser so they don't float. Some some pine cones do tend to float. Um, the ones that I use like to sink so I put them in the in in the mold. And then I just pour the resin on top of that. Um, you got to shake it and you, you just, because it'll, there'll be hidden pockets of air. You know, if, if the pine cone captures a bubble rising under it, it's not going to release it no matter how much pressure you put on it. So the only way to release that bubble is by flipping that cone over. Okay, you don't know which cone is holding that little bit of air. So what I do is I just take the, you know, I just bang it a couple of times on the on the bench, and it'll move them just enough to to make those bubbles come to the to the surface. Uh, acorn caps are, are 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 problematic because they hold a big bubble. Okay, they uh, uh, so those what I do is I make uh, I I I mix the resin and then I after I cook and dry. The, and cool down the acorn caps, I pour that into the mixing cup or bucket and I mix it all together and then I pour it in the, in the mold. And unlike the, uh, unlike the pine cones, they like to, to float a little bit so you've got to knock them down, you know, flip them over. You spend a little bit more time you know, playing with them just to make sure that no air is captured under them. I did. I didn't like them. They're, they're, they are not friendly to the bandsaw. Not at all. I, I did a termite nest once. Once. I destroyed a carbide blade with it. You can see the, 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 the sparks coming out of it. Um, the gumballs, people like to do gumballs. They have a lot of silica in them. They make beautiful pens. And if you're doing one um, and you're turning one, they work great. 
But if you're making blocks and cutting them into, into pen blanks, they will destroy the blade. So I like them, but I don't make them. Seashells, for example. They, they're nice blanks, but it's just, it's just not cost effective. Unless you make them you know, individually and just sell them like that. And then you know, the customer deals with, uh, with all Dutch, you know. I, I did once. I, I couldn't get used to the smell. Even if they were, they were bleached and cured and cleaned and whatever. It just, but they still had this, this very... Uh, I still have a 15, 20 jaws in the shed somewhere that I haven't cycled. So, yeah, except for in SWAT one year, when I, one of my earlier SWATs, you know, my, my pitch was, I'll put anything in resin and I, whatever. And this older lady came around and she just, she would come around and leave and come around and leave and come around and leave. And then finally, there was nobody at the booth, and she came, and, and, and she said, Hey, um, I hear you say that you can make... I'm like, yes, if it stays still for 15 minutes, I'll put it in resin, you can make a pen out of it, or whatever. And she pulls uh, of this little box about this size, and she says, Can you make a blank out of this? And I go like, Why would you want to ruin that beautiful box for a pen blank? And she goes, No, no, what's inside? It was the urn of her cremated husband. Her, his ashes were in there. So I changed my pitch. I said, I'll do anything, but I don't do ashes. So she, she apologized, and I mean, I was pretty embarrassed. And, and she's like, but I never expected, you know, somebody to... But yes, true story. They, I'm, I'm sure they mix. I, I, yeah, I don't, you know. I, I just, I don't know. It just, it felt weird, you know. Mm. Yes, it would have been unless I put dye in it or something. Now, after the fact, I had these great ideas of, well, I could have done this, I could have done that, but you know, don't. You know, don't go there. <laughs> this one already, so you can see that. If we can put the camera here again. Sorry. So you can see how the little, these little nipples are growing. And what will happen eventually, I'm, I'll, I'll get some that are, that are an inch and a quarter, inch and a half long. I'll snip them off and collect them. And when I, when I say collect them, it'll take me a year and a half to collect enough to make, you know, 48 blanks. And that's like my, my cycle for the year. And normally those end up going to, uh, to SWAT. I just, I can't make enough of them to put them on the website. This one here, yeah, that one's done. That, one, that one's going to get cut, you know, eventually. But I have, I have like 40 of these blocks right now that I'm moving. I'm pulling them out. So that one just, yeah, so I have a lot of those. Because it's one of those things I'll get to it later. And, and, and as the years go by, it later just never comes, so. These will, I'll cut these right here, okay? And then I'll cut that, I'll cut that edge off because that edge is kind of flat. Yeah. You can see, you can pass that one. Yeah, and on that one, you can see the colors, you know, the layers. But yeah, that, all four edges will get cut off and tossed. For two reasons. It doesn't have a whole lot of color. It'll use one color. And normally the resin, because these, these have been hanging out in the shop for a while, the, the resin doesn't, doesn't tend to, to, to stick to this outer edge here. When I cut the inside, because it's freshly cut, and it's, it's more, uh, you know, it, it's got the bandsaw tool marks on it, it creates just enough friction, enough surface for the other resin to stick to it. But this one here, it's almost like crystal, you know, smooth, and the resin, it might stick, but I can't work with mites. It's got to or it's not going to work. So you don't make blanks out of just that? Right. I don't, I don't make blanks out of this because, like I said, this, this block will have easily 200, 250 pores on it. Yeah. One of those layers didn't stick. I know it. One of those layers, the, the chance of, of one layer not sticking, uh, it's pretty high. You know, I have 250 chances, for example, of one layer not sticking. Okay, and and if I cut out, if I make it into one pen blank, that one layer that fails, it's going to break the blank. Well, th this I, I just cut it on the bandsaw, and then and then I just I get different shapes from it. Um, and then it goes back into one of these molds, and then I put resin in it, and repressurize and make more blanks. And then I cut those leftovers into other, like I said, it never goes away. <laughs> Where did that block go? 
Is it, is it cool down? Oh, yeah, this will be, this is, this is part of the raffle tonight, so. You know, I've, I've, cons I've, I've thought about doing a demo at, at SWAT. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> oh. So that's what the bottom looks like there. And, and as you can see, I, I use yellow and I use a sea blue. So this blank is going to have yellow, sea blue, and green, where those two colors mixed. You're going to have those. So that's another thing you have to, you know, you have to use colors that are compatible because if you use a purple and a blue, you're not going to see a difference. It's just going to look like a muddy blue. It's not, you're not going to see the purple and the blue. So you have to look for colors that, number one, are compatible and then either complement or contrast each other. This, this blank, it, it'll, if I leave it in the shop overnight, it'll be cool. Now, the problem with alumilite is because if, if it's hard and it's set, it doesn't mean it's cured. Okay? So what I do is all my blanks go into, into the oven. I have two uh, lab ovens. They're not commercial. They're, they're just lab ovens. And I, I can fit about 40, blank, 40 of these blanks into each one of them. So when I'm done casting for the day, I clean them up. And once they're clean like this, they go into the oven and they'll sit there for about 12 hours. And, and the reason is I have most likely have to cut them the next day because it's an order that's pending. Um, the alumilite takes about seven days, I think, think, I think it's five or seven days at room temperature to, to fully cure. So although it's set and it's hard, it's not fully cured. Okay, if I were to take that blank and I were to cut it up and make a pen out of it, okay, um, I've had, uh, it'll shrink. I mean, it's very minimal, but in, in the pen business, I mean, one millimeter is noticeable. You'll feel that. You know, when you turn a pen, if it shrinks one millimeter, you're going to feel that where the, the parts meet the, the blank, okay? So it does matter, all right? Now, the reason I cured is because, number one, so it's fully cured, and number two is, for me, I've noticed that on my carbide blades, the, the, the resin, when it's freshly cast, tends to be more abrasive on my carbide. Okay, now I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I, what I do is, just like I do tick marks here, I, I cut, I do tick marks on my band, so I cut this many blanks. And when I, over time, when I look at the number of blanks that I cut on any given month, if I'm cutting not fully cured resin, and fully cured resin, there's a significant number of cuts that I get. I get more cuts if it's fully cured, okay, than, than if it's not fully cured. So I don't know if it matters, but, you know, I haven't done the, 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 the science behind it, but, but I, I'll get several hundred more blanks cut with cured resin than with not fully cured resin. Yes, and, and that is because the, the, again, like I said, it's more, I've noticed that, that I can cut less blanks from any given blade, and I use carbide, I use the, the Resaw King from Laguna, I can, I get less cuts if I use freshly cast resin than if I use fully cured resin. You said you clean these up and then put them in the oven. Yes. The blade they go no, I clean them up on the joiner. I, 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 don't, I don't baby my joiner a whole lot. <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, it, it's got, it's carbide. You know, the little inserts got 40 teeth. Every time I got to flip them, it's just, ugh. I hate doing it. So I run it until uh, there's dust. I mean, just, it's just like powder coming out of it. Okay, it's time to change them. So, <laughs> yeah, it starts crying and then, okay, I'll flip the little blades. That's why it's not OSHA approved. <laughs> Now, when I run the flat face, okay, I do use a, one of those, uh, uh, no, oh no, I, I don't, I, I don't use that, I can't, I can't afford that kind of equipment. I use one of those uh, uh, tiling, what you, trowels, you call them, with the rubber, whatever, they work just as good, and if you run them into the joiner, you know, eight bucks, you get a new one, so, <laughs> yeah. The rub, yeah, and if not, with a little, when it starts slipping, because they will slip, you just put alcohol on it, your Goodwill t-shirt, and, and like new. <laughs> you're 
So, <laughs> I, look, I, today I put my, 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 my good clothes on, right, just to come out here, because in my shop, you, it splatters. You know, you'll get this, and, and if you get a little, one droplet, you're ruined the t-shirt. So I, I go, there's a Harbor Freight store, and then there's this little, it's not a Goodwill store, it's a, a flea market store. On Thursday, is it Thursdays? Yeah, Thursdays, everything is like 25 cents. You get like 20 shirts for five bucks, you know? <laughs> so, take them home, I wash them, I got a new set of, you know. So, okay. Thank you very much.